This is not recyclable, but these guys are building precious plastic recycling machines that can turn these into these. Oh, straws? There's a bunch of straws for you. Here's more straws for you. We've got heaps of things that are made with straws. <laughs> plastic pollution is a global problem that seems to just keep getting bigger. Because here's the thing, so much of the single-use plastic we use every day, like face masks and plastic straws, are really difficult to recycle. But here's how tech, decentralized and in the hands of the people can help fill the gaps. Hey there, I'm Carlos from Loop to Cycle. Precious Plastic is an open source project that designs machines to recycle plastic and then tells the world how to replicate them for free. They're educational, affordable, and you could build these machines from anywhere in the world. And their beauty is in their simplicity. So Carlos, builder of machines, tell us how it works. Okay, so this is a two-in-one, uh, loop to cycle two-in-one. So here we've got the injection machine and down the other end here, we've got the shredding section. So today we're gonna get Melissa to do some shredding for us. She's got some bottle caps here and we're gonna shred a couple of those bottle caps um, into this bucket, we'll catch it all and then after we've caught it, we'll put it into the injection machine and we'll go and inject some turtles out of it, I think. What do you reckon? Yeah, I like turtles. Let's make turtles. I like turtles. I got Raz up here to make sure I do everything safely. Yep. I know Carlos said it was really simple, but I'm afraid. No. So, let's do it. No. The plastics are washed and dried, then sorted into similar types and colours like straws, bottle caps or face masks to get a consistent product. Today, we are recycling some bottle caps. The plastic is fed into the shredder, which cuts the plastic into small flakes. I can press the button. This is what the bottle cap looks like when it's all shredded. And now we're going to... Inject. Inject. Yeah. The injection machine then melts the plastic flakes and injects it into a mold to form a new product. You can use different types of customized molds like combs, coasters, plant pots or whatever else you would like to design. Okay, so we've got the mold on and we are gonna inject... <laughs> I require a lot of help doing this. <laughs> oh my gosh, is it done? Um, I'm just making it look harder than it really is. Really, they. How many pieces do you make a day? Uh, he's making at the moment about 400 pieces a day. 400 pieces a day. <laughs> the muscles. Let's take a look at what we've made. So, can I ask you a question? When you remove all these bits, does this go back into the machine? Yeah. Oh, nice. We can use this. We just take, we just save these, and we're gonna put oh, in nice. the machine and inject another one. All right, you can reuse it over and over again. Yeah. Right. Whoa, that was laborious. Oh my god, how do you make four hundred a day, dude? <laughs> he worked these out. So. Yes. We stumbled across precious plastics, purely by accident, back in. It was 2015, so it was a while ago. And they were really in the very early stages as well. They were still working out how to do it, and, and it was quite difficult. The plans were open source, so everyone was available to, to use them, but the plans were very lacking in details, and it was, it was not, a, not an easy process. Our first extrusion machine was, used, was running with a Proton uh, windscreen wiper motor. And it was just a proof of concept, does it work? Just because it's open source doesn't mean it's straightforward. Initially, it was there was a lot of evolution because we were trying to nut out the plans and get it working reliably. But now we've got them working very reliably and we're just making very small changes to slightly upgrade this and upgrade that. But overall, it's it's been gradual. Just keep slowly improving, improving and improving. And, and we've had to because we've got machines everywhere now. We've got... I think we're sitting at about 50 odd machines in 14 countries. Which is why Carlos and other people like him in the precious plastic community are in high demand. But what they have to consider when building these machines is where they're going to. These machines are going to sometimes to really remote places. There's machines gone to Fiji, um, we've got Kuwait, Abu Dhabi, Thailand, 
Singapore, Malaysia, Borneo, Australia, the US, Bermuda, Vancouver in Canada. What we've really tried to do with the machines, I want to keep them super simple. And I want them simple because if they go to a kampung where you want them to go, there's limited knowledge, there's limited skill levels. If something breaks down, you want it as easy as possible to fix, but also you want to, by having it simple, it minimises the chance of anything going wrong. So we really have very little issues with the machines. The machines seem to be very reliable. The precious plastics community in a lot of ways, some have gone off, they've diverged on different directions and they're all doing slight bit different. Um, quite a number of them have gone to a little bit bigger machines, but when you go to the bigger machine, you can no longer use domestic power supply because you go to a lot of these kampongs, it's all domestic power. There's no commercial industrial power supply. And that way then you can have a bigger, a bigger reach. You can get a bigger network. You can create a bigger decentralized network. These machines are able to create value out of waste and prevent some of our most commonly used non-recyclable items from going to the landfill, the incinerator, or from polluting our natural world. They're actually fantastic plastic and they make really, really good product but there's so little weight in them. So the volume is very low. That's why there's no value in them. That's the problem. You can't send this stuff to a recycling yard and there's very few small scale recycling machines around. And even then, if they get stuck with the labor of having to clean it, it's not recyclable. When your recyclable material is dirty, it's not recyclable. It gets thrown away. It goes to landfill. So, there's very little that is actually getting recycled because it's not clean. We need more machines like these out in the world and in the hands of people impacted the most by plastic pollution. A big part of the problem is lack of education and lack of awareness. And also, the whole of society is set up on a centralised model. So you've only got recycling centres, big recycling centres where they actually shred and turn it into new pellets. You've only got them in the big centres. So you've got them in KL or in JB. But all the little villages around where they produce all this waste, there's nothing there. So they can't do the recycling really well. But if you educate them, they've got nowhere to send it anyway. If you can have little centres set up all over the place, that's the idea of behind Loop to Cycle. These machines are really small. They're very cost effective. Put one everywhere. Have them in every little community. Have them in little, the apartment blocks and then they recycle it there and then on the spot. All that material can go into new products and it can be everyday products that are used all the time. If we can have more of these machines in communities everywhere, you get these communities that they're bringing in food, so they're importing food and product into the community and instead of transporting out waste, the idea is that we could hopefully start to get them starting to export upcycled product. They're sending money out of their company or out of their community, but then they're also getting money coming back into the community by manufacturing product to go out. These plastic recycling machines support communities, build awareness and fill a gap in our recycling infrastructure. So will this be the silver bullet to end our plastic problems? Uh, not quite. It's scalable, but it's not the solution. You, you can't have enough machines. You literally cannot have enough machines for the amount of waste that we generate. And the only way to stop that waste is to stop consumption or slow down the consumption. Start buying less. Start reusing more. Start taking your own tiffin. That's a good start. <laughs> um, yeah, but it, it, it is scalable, certainly, but it can't, can't solve the problem, not at all, not at all. It's a part of the solution. Biggest part is stop buying. Okay, optimistic? I'm optimistic that we can cut down our single-use plastics, but these are a solution for the leftovers. Love it. I totally agree with you. I mean, we can definitely agree that the tap has to be turned off. Yes. Our addiction to single-use plastic has to end. But on the other end of it, using tech for good like this leaves us optimistic.